Polyism for holomorphic maps. Thank you. So, uh, as I said in the, in the first lecture, the goal of today's lecture is to present uh, at least the ideas of the proof of the theorem that I mentioned in the case without weight. So we will only consider the case of the measure of maximal entropy. So we will not use the perturbation of the of, of this operator at star. Uh, we could avoid to talk uh, completely about subharmonic functions. On the other hand, uh, in, a, in, in a course uh, that has potential theory in the, in the title, it would be a bit uh, unfair. So I will, in any case, minimize and do not do the maximum generality about subharmonic function that we need, because in any case, uh, as I already said, we will always use continuous functions. In this case, uh, all the definition, all the theorem that we need will be much simpler. So we'll just review quickly what we will need in the, that in a, a posteriori, just in the case of continuous function. Of course, there is a huge theory behind, but that since we will not use it, I will not spend no time on this. On the other hand, essentially, when we say that we do dynamics or, or whatever, uh, through potential theory, in my mind, it means that in a way or another, we are taking, for example, functions that we will do, that's the function u, and at some point, there will be this operator. I don't know how many people here are comfortable with using this operator, or at least know what it is. So I will start uh, essentially by de defining what it is. It is not much different than say that it's true to derivatives, but the point is that we need to do these two derivatives to function which are non situ at least continues in this course, but in general, we, it's good to know that it's possible to do much more in general. So at least to start from scratch, we take DC, which is an open structure. Then uh, every time I say a one form or a two form, I will mean uh, an expression of the form uh, alpha dx uh, plus uh, beta dy. These are the real coordinates in, in F2. Eh? I really want to start uh, more something like uh, gamma dx uh, dy. OK? Now, uh, we will we'll use the fact that, by definition, this one it will be minus the max dy by dx. Eh? OK? We, we, could, we could say these are the dual of the vector, but just think of them as really formal objects, okay? We will not use the interpretation of the tangent. We will not. Know. So these are formal objects, okay? You have these as forms. You have these to just satisfy this one. That if you swap the two of them, you change this. Okay? Just. Now, since we are doing holomorphic dynamics, we will often use the, the variable z, actually. So it's useful to, instead of these in R2, to change to the other variable. So recall that if I write dz, I just mean dx plus i dy, which is dz, and then I just do the linear. Dz bar will be dx minus dy. Okay. Now it means that if I have a differential form, I can write this as alpha prime that depends on the on the on the various coefficients plus uh, let's say beta prime dz bar. And I can write the two form as gamma prime dz when not dz bar. Okay, this is, this is just for an issue. We may sometimes say we will not really use it, maybe at the really end of the course, that a form of this type, I may call it one zero, a form of this type, I may call it zero one. Here it's not very important to make the distinguish the distinction here because it's only one type of the form, which is one one. But you can think that in higher dimension it would be important, but we will not focus on this. But just maybe that if I say one zero zero one, I mean that there are only this one or only this one. Okay. Now, what we can do on C, I mean on C on, on D, we cannot, we will never integrate one force, of course, but we want to know how to integrate two forms. Okay. Everything we do, we have, we have to integrate. So if I take a form and I integrate this. This is, is just this is nothing more than taking the integral of gamma as something like let me write in this way dx dy. By, by, by this, I just mean that, okay? But every time I never integrate a function, this is what I want to stress. If I integrate a function, I have to have a measure to integrate against. I can, which means I take the product of the function with the form and then I integrate it, 
Okay? This is just for a matter of notation because otherwise it's very easy to miss parts and especially when we start changing variable, if it's a form function, it is a form. Okay, so this is just for notation. Now, notice uh, that this object here, I can write it dz is blur. So it's the x uh, dy, which is essentially the, the Lebesgue one, i over two. Okay, so if you want to write the Lebesgue one, the Lebesgue measure, okay, you can write in, in, this, uh, in this coordinates here, just it becomes two. Okay, so sometimes you have to, you, know, you have to remember that there is this i, so it's not, uh, not a big deal. Now, if I have now a function u on, uh, on d, on this domain here that I took, if you want to, so we may need to have the, 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 the derivative of this function. And uh, this operator here, just the, 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 the derivative in z, it will be one over two, then the x times i, then the y, and then the bar, it is uh, one over two, the why are you doing this? Because now, as I said, our goal is to go and define given a function, u, not very regular, ddc of this function. Okay, let's start with the d. So, given a function, what is d of u? D of u is a one form. Okay, we get one form. Well, how is it defined? It is defined as d u in the x, x plus v u and u i, okay? I'm just taking this formally. Now, once you have uh, this notation here, so I could also write, uh, I will do, define this, the bar, d, let, for now, sorry, d of u, this will be the u in this z, this z, and the u bar will be the u in this z bar, this z bar, okay? Now, if you dip, so in particular, you can write this, uh, the, the differential of a, of, a form, of a function or with the base dx dy, or otherwise you use this one, okay? Now, if you want to act now, this is the action of functions. What, what if I act on forms? If I take a, a one form, one, zero, zero, one, or just one form, and I do it in the differential. If I do the differential of something alpha, the x plus beta dy, this will be nothing more than the alpha that I can define because alpha now is a function, uh, the x plus the beta, the y. Okay? Now, the definition that I will use is this one that dc is i over 2 pi, the bar minus d. This is just the definition, okay? If think of it that if you have uh, your space, which is two dimensional of the differential, you could use the x dy, you could use, uh, uh, okay, these are two, two things. In some sense, uh, you have this operator here, okay, that gives one direction. This will be the operator that will go in some sense in a transversal direction, okay, in order to be complete. Now, if you use this, uh, I can leave an exercise to over what would you have this, uh, this plus b dy, and uh, the bar of uh, alpha dx is y. Sorry, uh, let me have it. more convenient in this case to write already in this case here. Bar uh, z. Now what happens here? In the first one, it's nothing more than taking, uh, so we uh, have prime z plus uh, d with the prime the bar and you continue, okay? This is as before. And D in terms of the, the bar is equal to what? Yes, I'm going to I'm going to write it. So until now, you, it's just formal, okay? You may want to say, for example, this one, can I simplify? In the same way that if I have uh, now the X and the X, uh, I know that it's easy, okay? It's a kind of, kind of consequence of the object that if you swap for something, you also know that it's one, okay? Okay, now, so this, uh, this, I think you write down the, the same here. And if I write the last function, oh, this is a function, okay? Is, uh, it is the square plus the square of the one square of the function u. And it is four by the definition, the square u is the bar. 
Okay? So this is the platform of a function. Or I write in real coordinate. If I write in complex coordinates, this one. You already see that the operator here, what here will be a bit strange to do, this, this Laplace. Actually, here there is a simple the two derivative, the and the bar. Okay? So in this coordinate, it's very simple to write the Laplace. This is the first thing to do. Now we want to do more. So exercise. I give them here if you want to practice with this. We're not do them all here, but B, you can decompose the D plus the bar. Okay, one is the differential in this in Z, and the other is the bar. If you have this the two times the zero, if you have again in and this is zero, the bar and the bar is zero. Now DDC is a definition. Okay, I have to do DC and then I do D. I can decompose all these objects with this, uh, with this one. And this one actually is nothing more than I over two pi, the, the bar. So what is this operator that I have before, DDC, is up to taking the complex coordinate and writing the I and these things is uh, the Laplacian, okay? It's, it's just an operator. So if I take a function and apply this operator here, up to the, the constant, which we will not care, is uh, taking the Laplacian and again, putting the coefficients because remember so this is something that takes a function and gives a form okay this is just uh, this is just a level of functions I mean just a function goes to function okay I just put the derivatives to write four the four yes yes yeah because sorry that's equal to four del del bar of you what, 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 what? So the output of the Laplacian is a function. The output of the del bar is a oh, so Yes, yes, I did the point. When you do the differential, in order to write the coefficient, you need the derivative. In some sense, uh, the DDC <laughs> is the form whose coefficient is the Laplacian, which is the function. Okay? Now, other relations which are, uh, which are zero, it's D, but DD bar like this. Uh, since the because you have this is the same as doing the, the bar. If you have the we write all of them so now you have them. minus the, the bar, you use the other the swap. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, we should maybe also write the other one. Okay, this one and uh, i over two part over i over two the, the bar of u is equal to one over four la plata of u the x the y is equal to one over four the flat of u the over two the z the y okay sorry maybe it was a bit uh, pedantic but these are the objects that you are going to use okay now you may ask so you really mean the z the z is a bar very soon i will start forgetting x and y we only use z but I, for now let's do the definition so until now, you may ask, okay, these are formal things, but are, when they are defined? The simple answer is, uh, for now, just take function to C2, okay? If you is C2, your, your function that you are using, all these objects are well-defined. Now, for example, at some point, maybe some of you know already, that the measure of maximal entropy or the equilibrium measure is the DDC of the green function. The green function is on C2. The green function is older. Are we still allowed to write uh, the measure of maximal entropy as DDC of the older function? It means that we have to be able to define DDC on a older map. So let's see how, how we can do it in order to have everything well defined. Uh, are you going to tell us why it's the two pi in this denominator? No. Or is it magic? Which one? Two pi and the DDC in the DC definition. Why is it uh, we, you will see later. Okay. You will see there is a precise formula that I want to write, not to have coefficient. It is the fact that the DDC of the log of the modulus of Z should be the delta without coefficients. Ah, okay. It's normalized in this way. It's, it's just a normalization in order to avoid then in the computation that you will do the, the coefficients. Yes, 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 it's a good question. It's a, it will come at some point. Yes. So, now once we have this, So these are just formal definitions, okay? There is nothing, uh, nothing more. Exercise, okay. Taking out phi, 
which is a one form, uh, which of class C1, you take U, a function, function. Again, of class C1, say on, uh, on D, which is an open set in C, okay? Then they take a ball if you want, it's not, it's not important. And then assume, in order to avoid problems, that support of phi intersect the support of U is uh, compact in D, okay? So the, then, so, this one is compact there. Now, we can show that the integral of phi against del du, okay? Now, this is a, a one form, so you can, if I want to integrate it to get a two form, for example, I put this. This one is equal to the integral of u again this. Okay. If you want to prove it, this is Tox. Okay. You just apply Tox and you use the fact that the integral of the boundary is zero because uh, nothing is there near the boundary. Okay. So if you want to prove this is Tox. Say sorry. The second integral is compound. The second one is the computer is on one dimension. So uh, the domain? Yes, 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 because now this is one form, this becomes a two form, and now multiply is still a two form. So I, I can integrate against you. So it's really the fact that on U, on D, I, in some sense I pass the derivative from here to here up to the sign. We will not care much. But and the point of the part of the integral of the boundary is zero because everything is zero near the boundary. So my limit is where I Oh, that's a function. No, that's a function. Uh, this is a function. Yes, I could write a wedge, but uh, it's, I prefer to write it. I mean, sometimes we write this uh, as notation phi against, for example, du is equal to u against d phi. Okay? With this, I mean, once we have fixed the domain, and very soon it will be d1. So this is just the notation, okay? Now, let's say, sorry, but there's no negative sign. No, I checked. I mean, I checked it should not be, but in any case, very soon we will do two derivatives. So if there was a sign, it will disappear. <laughs> if there was one, it will disappear. But I think there is. And uh, because at some point you swapped in one of the two, the two differentials. Now, for the same reason here, if you have p against the bar of u is equal to doing the integral of u, the bar of phi. Actually, in order to do this, you have to do stock that you have in mind, but with the differential d. And then you have to somehow decompose the part that you get uh, and see that this is equal to this and this is equal to this from reason of degree. But uh, just take this two with stocks. Uh, and now, consequence of this, uh, so size one, size two. Now take u, which is C2 on D, okay? And u and B, let's say two functions. And again, you take the support of u intersect with the support of D, compact in D. Now you have the integral of U against DTC of V is equal to V against the DTC of V. Okay, if there was a sign before, now it's not there anymore. Again, this one I could write as U against DTC of V is equal to V DTC of V. Or if you want, even DTC of U. So if you want, what, every time you have the integral and stocks applied because you don't have stuff on the boundary, you can move the DDC from one side to the other, okay? Again, here I use, I use C2 in order to define my objects, okay? Uh, just question the first <laughs> So uh, I get the DDC is I over pi. So when you apply, choose me, because when you use the 2D uh, divider, so when you use the uh, two boxes, you've written the way down, I think you get miss the two. It's possible. Uh, sorry, the two equations. Uh, one. Maybe that is not this two. Yeah, it's possible. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it's possible. Yes, 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 yes. Take the uh, yeah up to constant, which will be every time we, at some point we will see positive or negative. So yes, it's possible. So good. The exercise is uh, every time I write the things, check the signs at the constant. Okay, this is the exercise. <laughs> Thank you. I will check. <clears throat> now, sorry, I have a question. Uh, so this. Form of color product, which is basically integral of product. Yeah, this one is this. Uh, so it's linear, not uh, uh, mm -hmm. semi linear. I mean, uh, there's no complex contribution. For now, I'm just taking uh, 
function on uh, R2, which is C. Okay, I see. Uh, I'm not seeing this as a coupling of something for now. It's just the real input. Pairing or not. Now, <clears throat> thanks to these two exercises, definition. Now you can take U, which is just L1 in D. I don't say anything I mean by the bag, okay? Now you can define DBC of U. You can define this with U as is a linear, which is a continuous linear operator from Let's say they stitch you on D to R. Everything I could do, I could extend to complex functions, but uh, let's just take it uh, real. Okay, and which is given by the D. So if you have to apply to V, DDC U, this is the integral of U again DDC for every D. Okay. Now, this one, sorry, this one, let me say, for example, uh, with compact support uh, in D, okay? Then uh, what one can extend uh, in general, but let's take compact support here. You can define, okay? Now, if you just have an integrable function, the DDC of this function, so two, de two derivatives, not even one, is well defined, just because you send on the test, you differentiate the test, and then you do the, the integration, okay? So every time I write DDC is well defined now, okay? We, again, we will only use continuous functions, in, in essentially, but still, obviously, for, for continuous function, you need to define this. Now, the exercise here yeah, is that, for example, now, exercise, I mean, it's not uh, trivial, but it's, uh, it's how it to well normalize. Take u of z, it is log of modulus of z, okay, so just the logarithmic function at zero. Then you have that the DDC of log of u is equal to delta. Of zero. Okay, if you take the delta zero, the Dirac mass, the logarithm of, uh, of, of the of the modulus of z, you take the DDC, this operator, the Laplace, whatever you want, actually you give this one. So you can solve this, this operator if you want. You can you have the delta, you can find the solution, which is this one, of this measure here. Now you will not be surprised if I give you another positive measure, thanks to this one by convolution or whatever, you can find a function you know, that we will find we call the potential. Such that the DDC will be, will be the other way. Okay, this in some sense is the center of what happens in potential. Now, at this point, I should, but I will not do, uh, start talking about supermodic functions. And I could define them in, in, in a number of ways. But since uh, we are only going to use continuous functions later, it's enough for me to say that if u is c2, c0. Okay, continue. Okay, subharmonic. You can say that it is a function u such that DDC of u, which is a form, two form, so it's a measure in particular, it's positive. Okay, if it's not this, it is not true a priori. Okay, you need something stronger than upper semi continuity, but it's more or less true. But for continuous function, it's true. Okay, and uh, I mean, it's a given. Okay, you can take this as a definition. So I don't need to start talking about. Uh, uh, average maximum modulus so this we just say that for continuous function which we will use them a function is subharmonic if uh, the laplacian is a positive measure okay so now we are in particular interested to taking positive to taking measures and study them by the properties of their potential then we call this potential of the measure okay this exercise tells you that once you have a measure Thanks to convolution in practice, since you can solve delta get the potential for the delta, if I give you another measure, you can find u such that it is u is like this measure. Okay, I will not give the details here, but this comes from this exercise. But if u uh, isn't always a measure? Yes, it is a two form. It's a two form. You just think of this. It's a continuous linear operator, blah, blah. So it's uh, you can act, okay? And you think of this as a measure. Yes, I should be a bit more precise and say that it acts also on C0, but I will leave this detail uh, there, okay? So just think of this, uh, well, no, okay? Just a continuous, it's, because again, I don't want to focus too much on this because then we will only use continuous functions in the theorem that we tier. 
Of course, if you are interested, we can tell more in detail about this. But maybe we don't need it. Okay. Now, so this is just to say one. So the only thing to, to retain until now is one denotation. Well, two, the fact that if I have a function which is even just integrable, you can take the DDC. And if I say subharmonic, imagine that it means that DDC is positive, okay? Now, definition. Definition. So, take uh, mu, a positive measure, a measure on D, a potential. Of new, of new, is the uh, function u subharmonic from b to whatever, such that the DDC of u is equal to new. Okay, subharmonic because a posteriori this is positive, so it's uh, it, it has, has to be subharmonic. Now, mm -hmm. it may be just for my notation if it comes. Uh, I may say that uh, a function u from d to r is uh, quasi subharmonic. Let me write QSH just for simplicity. Okay. If maybe the Laplacian is not positive, but up to adding some smooth part, uh, it will become positive. Okay. So what does it mean? So subharmonic, we say DDCU is positive. Okay. This means subharmonic. Here is just if there is for some constant, if I add Lebesgue, it's positive. The constant can depend on the function, okay? It means that this, if I want to write a bit uh, as operator, this is more than non zero, but something like minus something smooth, okay? Which means up to smooth terms, if I want to study this, it's, it's, it's the same as considering this positive. Why, why I'm, I care about modifying this? Because the point is, you already know, we are going to talk something on P1. So C is a constant. It's a constant, yes, yes, yes. A constant that can depend on, on you. Okay, and this is the bag, so two form, two form. Okay, so in particular, it says that up to adding a smooth part. Okay, so for example, this function here, the measure, for example, it can have a delta, but it cannot have a minus delta because the minus delta you cannot compensate with something smooth. Okay, it can have a minus something smooth because you can add something smooth and make it positive, but not something irregular, not something too singular. Okay, for example, not minus. The integral on the boundary of S1 or something, because then you cannot compensate with something smooth. Okay? This is the other point. Up to something smooth, you have this one. So by smooth, you just mean the. Uh, Situ. I mean, uh, yeah, let, so, so take the bag, take the bag. To you. Le bag. I see. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, this is something smooth. I mean, yes, I mean, sorry, because if alpha is a smooth form, Actually, it's always true that there is some constant such that it is less than the bag on, on a neighborhood and less, maybe less than minus the bag. So, up to something smooth, which I mean, a form which is smooth, which means essentially that is always level. Okay, now I only give a, an exer a last exercise here. Uh, of course, I don't have maybe, maybe I say it, but it's not even necessary. If I have two potential for the same measure, Okay, the difference will have the DC zero. This is what we call harmonic. We'll not use it, but it's uh, just to have to have the notation. If the DC is zero, I call it harmonic. So if you have two potential, two different potential, the difference is harmonic. Now it's a theorem that I will not state it, but it's, it's, it's a known and important theorem that once you have the DC zero, harmonic, it implies that it's smooth. So if you have two potential of the same measure, you automatically know that the difference is smooth. Okay, so even adding, retiring something is not important. Okay, so the exercise I want to give, we will do more refined version of this later, but it's just to give the flavor of what we will end up doing in this course. Huh? Is that suppose that I have mu, a measure, and suppose that as uh, with, uh, let's say, bounded potential. Okay, the potential is bounded, it's a bounded function. Think of, of a continuous function, for example, the DDC of a continuous function, okay? Then it implies that the support of mu is a perfect set. It has no isolated points. Why? If there was an isolated point, uh, the potential locally there would be the delta. It will be a delta, so the potential will be logarithmic. 
you cannot compensate with this arrest. Okay. Corollary of this is that the Julia set is a perfect set. Because once we will know in a moment that the green function is continuous, actually bounded, it's enough to say that then the Julia set is a perfect set. Okay. This is just to give an example of what, what people what one can do with, with these kind of things. And in general, the leitmotif behind the, the bit discourse uh, or uh, other idea in potential theory is the following, which we will do a bit more later when I do more notation. But you have uh, suppose that you have u and u prime super on d, okay? And suppose that you have uh, let's say v, did you see? Of u is less than the DC of v. Okay, so you have two two harmonic functions, the potential to measure, and this measure is more than this. Okay, it really means that the different is again a positive measure. Okay, then if u if v sorry is bounded, then v u is bounded. Okay. Because I think of something smooth, it's something smooth that does not dominate the delta. Indeed, the, the potential is there, I mean, some bounds, so you, you cannot. Okay, so this is the kind of idea you are going to use both to prove the theorem and to prove the norm and whatever. Okay, if B is continuous, U is continuous. Same kind of idea. Okay, we will see later more refined things of this because when we have to estimate norm. We will see that if you have a control on the modulus of continuity here, it gives a control. Of the... oh, why is the second one? Huh? Why is the second one true? Uh, I mean, we will see later even, even with the control of the modulus continuity. So it's, it's a very explicit one, actually. This one. We will see later in more, uh, more precisely. But the idea is that uh, subharmonic function, I should say that they are upper semi continuous. So semi continuous. So what you have to prove here is that it's lower semi-continuous in general. And you already know that the difference is upper semi-continuous because the difference of the measure is upper semi-continuous is uh, positive. So the difference is also upper. So the function was lower semi-continuous. It's a play, it's a game like this. But this is not quantitative. We need something quantitative later. So we will uh, I put, I put this to it. So for now, the thing that this result here, you can do quantitatively. All the replace all the or Okay, now I think I've done enough notations. Yeah, just one thing. Now you may say, okay, all very nice, but uh, it's for an open set on uh, D, uh, D on C. Okay, we want to work on P1. Now, on P1, there's the nice, but in this case, not very nice uh, uh, feature that there are no subharmonic functions. I mean, they're not constant. <laughs> it's, uh, once you try to, 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 to find one, it's, they're only constant. Okay. Because it's a compact, so then it's a boundary. Again, if I was to do the real definition, uh, blah, blah, I would say that the harmonic function have the maximum principle, and so the maximum should be on the boundary. But if you don't have the boundary, you, you cannot tell the maximum piece. So, but uh, the main point now is that we want to work on P1. Okay, so let's try to move on P1. Let's see what we can get. Okay, let's try to move on P1 now. Now, first of all, we need the back measure. What is the Lebesgue measure here in this case? We, we define omega to be the full finish to And we write the definition now. It's not very important. Just think that it's the analogous of the Lebesgue on P1. It's a way to compactify the Lebesgue measure to have uniform on P1. Okay. In coordinate, I mean, if I write the coordinate, uh, this is DDC of log of 1 plus z square. One over two plus delta at infinity. Now, what's the idea? In, in the chart, if, you, if I build on the chart, C in P1, where, where C is not infinity, okay? In this chart, then you have this one. But this function here diverges, one is not important, precisely at log of Z, and you go to infinity. So at log infinity, this part here is minus delta infinity. Okay. So if you add this part here, you kill precisely the singularity. Okay. And this one is smooth. Okay. This is smooth. I 
I could write another definition, but I promise myself that I will not do it. You could, instead of P1, define something on C2 and push it down to P1. I, ju I just promised to myself that I will not do things on C2. So I will not do it. But this is another way. You could use two coordinates ZW in, C in, in, in C2. And on the chart where Z is not, is not zero, you use one ratio. In the other chart, you use the other one, and you see that they glue together well. But it's just to say, this is smooth, OK? You don't really need the definition, just need that you have a smooth form of the one, OK? Because we will use this. If you want, one can check that if you have an automorphism, this, yeah. Why do you call this the day? Why, why is this more the than than any other two form? No, just the, no, no, just the, it is comparable to the back. I mean, the, if you want the density one of the other is moot. The density of one with respect to the other is moot. Sure, but then you could multiply this by anything that, that dies at infinity or something, and you still get. Yes, yes, yes. But I, I, okay, very good point. So this one, I'm going to say, this is for every automorphism of P1 you can think of. This is invariant. And actually, it's characterized in this way. In the same way that Lebesgue is invariant by translation or things like this, this is invariant by all automorphism of P1, and it's the one characterized in this way. So this is the, if you Yes, modus, automorphism. Yes, so this is characterized in this way. It's the one you get if you try to do it. Okay? So this is, in some sense, the good one. To call it Lebesgue one once you compact the size. Yes, this is a good one. Now, the point is, now we have P1, okay? P1. And now, okay. suppose now that I have, uh, now let's uh, again mu be a measure, a probability measure mm -hmm. on P1, okay, mass one. We find, we call quasi potential of mu is a function of mu. Such that we cannot get the DDC of u is equal to this one because it will mean that u is subharmonic and we cannot have it. But we say that this plus omega is equal to u. Okay, this we can do. Now, it always exists, uh, blah, blah. Now, the point that I want to make here is maybe a, a little parenthesis on uh, cohomology. Is this uh, if I take. So why is this so yeah, is the definition? So why is this so there? So or you do explicitly, and you just say you take this one, bound you one. Suppose for example it's compact support in C, you just have to say okay now I remove the delta at infinity, so I I, I add and, and remove the delta. It's a way to say plus delta minus delta here. I and now I, I move all the problem to C, and now I'm solving as in C. Because I can't solve. The, the real notion is I take this one on C, for example. I take the logarithmic potential that we know how as before. This also has a delta at infinity, minus delta. If you add this, you just simplify the two delta. It's the same proof as in C, just that you have this minus delta infinity, minus delta infinity that you simplify. But so you can solve, very good point. But it's even more than this, that it comes from a reason of cohomology that Measures in uh, if, if I consider measures like set of new measures on P1 now with sign, okay, with the sign positive, negative. So, in particular, the sum of a positive and a negative measure, okay. If I take this one over those of the form DTC of a function, okay, so if I quotient those up to the part of potential, this is dimension one. One, one way to see this is combining the Dede bar lemma, which I don't want to talk about. But if you want the fact of the dual, the dual the Poincare duality, that H0 is one component, H2 is one component. And so measure in some good cohomology theory should have dimension one, OK? And this is the good one. You could say why I take uh, this operator DDC, because we want to use these, these directions here. But the point here is that now measures in cohomology as dimension one. So you have one generator, for example, the bag, okay? Every other measure of, the, of mass one satisfies this for some u, okay? The difference of two measures of positive of mass one is easily exact. 
if you have any measure, which means uh, of mass zero, which means uh, positive plus negative, uh, the, the two positive and negative parts are, are the same mass, this is a DC of a function, okay? In particular, for every mu with sign, there exists a constant such that mu minus C omega, and C is, this, is the positive part minus the, the, the negative part, is equal to DC. Okay, so not only you can do probability, but up to multiplying by a, by, a, by a constant because of this, okay, you are not in the class of omega, you are in the class of C times omega. Okay, and then you have this one, which is the potential. Okay, so until here, I'm just defined. Uh, I think I have to stop. I think it's a good point. Okay, so let us stop here. So until here, we just say this and we will use this object here. Yeah, just right. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Like this? Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so now I will stop for now with the definition. Maybe we'll continue a bit later. But uh, so the theorem now is the first one that I mentioned yesterday. So it's, it's now classical. I mentioned already yesterday the story with the corollary the consequences. We want to prove I will prove a bit a slightly different statement than what I said yesterday. Instead of pull back points, I will pull back is put forward. Then one can guess that from this one can can get the result for almost all points. I will do the smooth version, which is that if I take alpha, the smooth form on p one, d minus n, f n star. Now again, f is a rational map. We go back to the setting of yesterday. Okay, I take this out alpha. This goes to mu, which is totally invalid. Which means that f star of mu is equal to d times mu. Okay? So we prove this. I stated yesterday in the form of for all those two points. We prove in this case for the smooth one, it will not, it's not the complicated part then to get to the almost all points. So because we will need this part. So I prove this one now using the tools that, uh, that, that we did now. Now, maybe uh, a preliminary comment is that uh, uh, I just said this thing of cohomology. Okay, so this one is the mu that doesn't depend on alpha. Okay, so in particular, this, the limit is well defined. Uh, yesterday I said it for alpha is a delta, but for almost all delta. Here I did a smooth to a version. It's, it's a related, it's the same proof then. It's, uh, so I do this one. Now the point is, uh, let me just mention is that I mentioned the cohomology, but it's a computation just if you do it. That if I take, for example, omega, okay, to be in studio, and I pull back it, okay, this. Uh, as mass d. You see, because if by dual you put forward the function one, the function equal to one, this is omega x star of one, and this one is the function constant to d. Okay, so the mass of this is d. So what does it mean is that this one, I will not enter too much on the detail, blah, blah, but this is again a probability measure, is again smooth. So in some, so again, so this in the same class of omega in the cohomology. What does it mean is that let's start. There exists to be, let's say, yes, the smooth, such that d minus one f star of omega is equal to omega plus the DC of is the potential of this of, of this one. You take this as a as a form, as a positive measure, okay? It has a potential, it's this one. This is smooth, this is smooth, one can check that actually this one is enough, but it's uh, this one is okay? So this is the first vector. Now, let's do the second one. What if I take d minus two x plus star of omega? What is this? This is d minus one x star of the previous one. Sorry? That's a different thing. It's oh, yes. 9 million. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, you want me to change the degree? Give, give me another letter. Yeah, I mean, yeah, this is it's negative. We prefer to write this uh, one over this square. Let me write in this way for so all this and the right here this one. Okay, so what I get, I get f star of omega d over d, which is again this one. So this omega plus the c of d plus what? The full bulk of this. Now, you can believe me that uh, could write it formally, but it's again by why it's like this. Uh, if I pull back something like this, uh, it is the DVC of V composed F over F. Okay, just pull back instead of the measure, back the potential. Okay, so now we found this formula. Okay, now we know that the potential, the quasi potential of this one, the way we expect to make is the one we had before plus this term. Okay, now if I continue, D minus n fn star of omega is equal to omega plus the dvc of v plus v composed f over d plus v composed f n minus one n minus one. This is the step n. Okay. Now this comes the important point. It will keep coming in, uh, in different flavors. This one. This is smooth, so it's bounded. Okay. Each of these terms, uh, it's bounded by this part is bounded by the same constant, norm infinity of, of v. Okay. And this is geometrically going to zero. So this one actually converges. It's a series of smooth functions. This converges to some function that we call g, which is the rest of zero. Okay. So what do we find? That if I define mu to be omega. Plus DTC of G. Okay, now for all n, I don't take the, I just use omega for now. Eh? For if I have omega, if I take the full back for all n, now I come back to this one. I can give you an exercise eh? to prove that a series of smooth functions geometrically converging to zero and norm infinity, but with some bound in the norm uh, C2. Because every time you just compose by, let's say, the, the norm of this one, actually it is called that. For some time. Okay. It's another idea that will come later also. But if you have a series of smooth functions, okay, norm infinity goes to zero geometrically. And each of them is smooth. And the smooth, the smooth norm of each one is controlled in this way. Because each time you just have, say, the Lipschitz or no, not the Lipschitz. What is control? Sorry. It's older. So, ah, ah, okay, okay. So you have what that you have C two. I mean, you have V composed C norm C two. This is controlled by the norm V C two, and uh, something like uh, I don't know. If you want to be very very uh, hard, you just put this one uh, C two twice. Uh, I don't know something like this. Uh, uh, it's derivative, derivative. Tac tac. Uh, yes, I put swap twice. Even like this. Okay, this is a constant. Now, here, if you want to control this one, you cannot control in situ because a priori this constant here is more than the D. So it's diverging in situ. But you already know that it will be a continuous function. In the same way, you can say I decompose this series as a sum until some n plus the sum until n to infinity. This part you control in norm infinity. Because you know it's, it's geometric, so it is very small. So you just have to estimate this part until to some n, and this one you can bound with all their norm, which is much quicker. I will do it later a case which is more complicated, but this you can keep as an example. So why is it that the holder that comes up and not C1 or not Lipschitz? Ah, no, 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 I don't, no, 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 you cannot say. Okay, uh, so I should find the n, but. Uh, let me let's try. Let's try. It take a bit of time, but let, let's try. So, if, no, no, no. Maybe. We can do later. Maybe we do later. So the point is, uh, this one. Uh, let's say it's. Uh, we use latent solder, not now. So let's just take it. It's C zero for now. What we want to do is uh, uh, now we want to change. We want to put alpha. 
and to get the same result for all alpha, because this was in some sense the point. Well, you can believe me now that if I say the total invariance, because this one, uh, they iterate another F, it will go to the same limit because uh, it's the same. But let's see why it's independent of alpha, which is the main point. Now, if I take alpha, smooth, is also omega plus DBC of u, or some u, which is against me. Now, if I take e minus n fn star of alpha, this is d minus n fn star alpha plus uh, d minus n dbc u composed alpha. Okay, now this one goes to mu. Okay, which was before. This one is uh, like the last term of this here. It's bounded in norm infinity, this term here. This one doesn't change the norm infinity. So you can imagine that this one is going to zero. I could be more, more precise, but the idea is this part is going to zero. Okay, more than this, uh, it goes in zero in a way that if you want to compare with the previous computation, in some sense, you are just adding this plus u in the last term every time. So it's really something that when I will do this computation, we will see that it's inside the last part and it will never see. So it doesn't change the regularity, okay? So it's, uh, it's really the same, it goes to zero, the last part. And... Uh, this is the same new I phrase omega- Alpha? Plus uh, this, this the DVC of U. Yes, and in the limit? No, no that's all new, not new. <laughs> no, 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 wait, wait, wait. I, I, I take omega, okay? I start with omega. Yes. Let's say the limit is what? Mu. 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 Where is that? Alpha is omega plus the DC of U, a function. U function. <laughs> Ah, yes, yes. I mean, yes. I cannot take the DDC of a function. Mu is a measure. Yes. Sorry. No, sorry, sorry. It's a DDC. Every time I take this, is a function. Yes, it's a. There's this one. So this is the same as before. And this one will, will go to zero. Okay. So this is the idea. What we used here. But we use the action of F star in cohomology in some sense. And the fact that uh, it's well controlled by pullback. Now, we can already imagine that if we want a method that works for the transfer operator, which means that pullback, but also multiplied by, by some real weight, this, uh, this, for example, is not true anymore, that will keep the, the, the mass. Or uh, all the estimate that it will DDC. I used, for example, that uh, if I have, uh, I use the fact that F star commutes well with, with the operator DDC, pullback. If I do, F, if now I have to do F star and multiply by a weight, I cannot interchange the multiply by a weight with the operator DDC. It's a, because I also have all the, all, all the derivative of, of the weight inside, okay? Mm -hmm. So this is a method that it's not really a lot of hope to work if we want to use the transfer operator with phi, okay? So let's try to do another something. We will try something else. But before doing something else, I want to give the idea of why we can, uh, for a norm that we will not maybe care a lot later, but why we can get the spectral gap here for a norm that uh, it's not really related to Holder. For example, it will not give a spectral gap for Holder, but uh, it will give something because it will be a motivation ingredient, for example. Now, as we said, I can take uh, functions u. Let me take a function u from p1 uh, or uh, h, <laughs> p1 to l, okay? Let me define a semi-norm here. I define a semi-norm dsh. Again, think that I'm using continuous functions, so everything is well-defined, but it, it's not necessary. And this is this, is the inf of the mass, let's say of, uh, New of new plus or minus such that DDC of H is equal to new plus minus new minus. 
This is exact by definition. Okay, I take H, a function. I take TDC. It's mass zero in the sense of cohomology, so it's the difference of a positive and a negative part. I take the best possible. Okay, maybe it's an inf, actually it's a minimum, but let's take the, the best possible, okay? This is a, a possible, you can check that it's a semi-norm. Why it's a semi-norm? I could add a constant and uh, it doesn't change. So for example, this is a semi-norm. If I want to make it a norm, I have to take this, uh, for example, plus uh, L1, I don't know this. L1 on the back, I can make it norm, but I, will know, I don't want to care about, the, about this part. Let's just take, to take about this, okay? Because let's check why we can hope that in this semi-norm we have a contraction for, for, the, for the operator, now dual, F star push forward. Why F star contracts Yes, It's enough to do for the semi-norm because we already know that we have an invariant line which are the constants, okay? So then we take the complement space and we try to do a complement space if this one has some way to be, to be contracted. Again, I just do the idea because then it will not really work with, 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 the, with the transfer operator, but let's try. Now, before doing this, let me just make a comment that I did this proof pulling back forms, okay? So in this inf, so is there only one way to write BDC8? No, or there are many. All possible, all possible ways. ways. And so actually, can get the infimum of, of the new plus and new minus or the supremum? It's the infimum of all the combination, like this, of all the combination, new plus and new minus. So if by any chance there is one, the composition which new minus is zero, then the norm is zero. Yes, but by, by cohomology, they have for the same mass. Oh, they have for sure the same mass. Okay. They have for sure the same mass because the difference is exact. So they have the same mass. So this is why you say plus or minus because that's the same. Sorry. It's the same one. And so in particular, you are saying, yes. I mean, if it's uh, the difference of two delta, it's, it's two one, <laughs> because you cannot simplify. If there is some smooth part, for example, you can simplify the smooth part from one with the other, for example. You can simplify some if both are there, if uh, you can kill it adding a delta to both, you don't need, for example. Okay, now we need, we say that the, the approach that we can have here is pull back measure, okay, or we could push forward function, okay. Another approach that we say is that we could try this. I do f and star like this, as to a function g, and I try to say that it goes to a function to a constant, okay. Which a posteriori I can define mu to be g to be in this way. The, the linear operator doing the limit of this is the measure here. So I could say this by, by duality. Okay. Now I could give a proof of this theorem now that proves this one, that proves by duality that this one converges to constant. Now the point is that this proof that I know in this proof specifically uses the, the property of superharmonic functions. Uses the part that I think the TDC of this is positive, I have some properties. And again, it's something that cannot work once we, once we will take the perturbation to the transfer operator. Okay? Because also this one will not be a constant. We have not much way to study with supermonic. So I don't want to do this proof. Okay? What I want to say is that there is also proof by duality, but this is really, this I, I make as a way to explain a bit what are the potentials, even if we will not really need it. But this one, I will need me to really introduce superharmonic function precisely and some quite delicate theorems. And so we did not do it. But let's try to check if this one, once we know these theorems, now we know it's true. Because we prove in this way, if there is a way to quantify the convergence with the norm. Let's try. And this is the possible semi-norm. Now, suppose that I take now G, okay, with some norm DSH. Uh, if I take F star of G, well, how can I write? Suppose that G is a, is a, has some decomposition. Okay, then I will take the U from the decomposition. F star of G will be F star and U plus minus U minus. It is F star and U plus minus F star and U minus. So for all the decomposition that I can take for this function here, at least there is this one. So if I want to take the VSH norm, VSH comes from difference of subharmonic function. Because in practice, you are measuring the best way to decompose this function as to subharmonic function. Okay. F star G 
Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, different, yeah, because in the same way that I define subharmonic functions, I didn't define, I talk about subharmonic or quasi subharmonic functions as a subharmonic plus a smooth term, you could define difference of subharmonic functions, which is on out of a polar set, maybe, but difference of a subharmonic function. Now, these are the real potential that I use in the cohomology part, because the difference of two measures, if that's it's in totally zero in cohomology, is a, super, is a difference of subharmonic function. Take a real a delta minus a delta. The potential of this is the log here plus the, delta, the log in the other one. Okay, so this is the difference of subharmonic function. So this is really the point. And the point is here you can put a norm. It's the best decomposition possible given this. If I have to estimate this one, it means that it's at least is it no more than GDSH. Okay. No more, maybe there is a constant. Uh, maybe I have to check the decomposition. Maybe there is a two, I don't know. But, uh, because these are, I'm doing very locally. Maybe I have to do in P1. Maybe there is some constant, but it's not important. The point is that if I, divide, if I take this, uh, I guess it's like this. But then I, if I divide by D, this one gets divided by D, which contracts, OK? Again, this I did very locally. I should take also into account as part of the norm which uh, may, 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 could make the estimate a bit more complicated because Ah, yes, it's a contraction, yes. It's contracted by D. I didn't get, how did you get this less than equal? Because if I want to write the epsilon of this one, this is the info on all uh, uh, new prime plus minus, such that F star of G is new prime, prime plus prime minus plus uh, minus prime. Okay. For example, I can take this too. And their mass is, is given by this one. So their mass is the G is the GDSH norm. So the mass that I get here, this is, for example, I can take F star new plus minus prime. The mass of this is bounded by G, DSH. But then, then you said something, oh, you know, more or less. Yes, yes, yes. There can yes, be yes, a so constant, but if there, there can be a constant, then it's not a contraction. <laughs> no, no, no. What I'm saying is that here I just did a semi norm. I did a semi norm, and uh, uh, I didn't consider this thing. I didn't consider the fact that when I iterate, I should also make sure, for example, how this one changes. For example, I could adapt to a constant. If I start with something of, uh, for example, I could change this, I could take a, if I start with something of integral zero, I continue with Lebesgue, the image will not have integral zero with Lebesgue. So maybe I have to add a constant to correct the term. And this constant will go inside here because maybe change the norm. So this part contracts, but a bit of care has to be, when I say there is a complementary space which is contracted, it's true. But this complementary space, for example, what it is, what of integral zero with Lebesgue is not invariant. So in order to correct this, ad this adjustment, I have to also take into account this, and this will make this become a, a constant, uh, but then this one is independent of any. So I have some adjustment to put because I have to take this and to reduce every time to an invariant plane, which is not true, okay? But up to some technical detail about how to control this, which is similar to what we did before, on the other hand, how to adjust with the geometric series so that everything will converge. This is really the idea, okay? This is the only idea I want to put here, is that if you are allowed to use this norm, you can get a spectral gap. What's the problem here? A superharmonic function can be very singular. Can be? It can be very singular. I mean, for example, there is the logarithmic singularities. Mm -hmm. It can be singular. I mean, it can be discontinuous in a huge set. There is no way to say, to get a theorem on holder maps, because at the end, we want uh, something that at least works for holder functions. Holder functions have no relation with DSH. It's not true that all the older norm dominates the DSH norm or the contrary. It's, uh, it's completely unrelated. One is a condition on the real regularity. One is a condition on the DDC, so it's uh, on today, but so it's, it's really unrelated. So this one alone has no hope again to work with, with, the, with the perturbation. But in any case, it's a good ingredient. So this will be an ingredient in finding the norm that works with the perturbation. Okay? So since it is an ingredient, so this is finished what I want to say about the classical first theorem. Let me say, hey, now it's a bit tough. There should be anyone that can start today. <laughs> Let's try to prove the, to give the, the idea 
Once this is uh, okay, so what we learned a bit of cohomology, a bit of potential theory that we can prove this theorem by pulling back. We can prove this theorem, we say it by pushing forward, but it's delicate. And there is a norm that has good chance to be controlled, but at first, uh, has no relation with holder maps. Second, if I take this operator and I try to decompose the DDC of this, I get a lot of derivatives here, in particular all the derivative of phi multiplied, and I have no control to estimate with this. Okay, so these are some ingredients that I want to use, but they cannot be the only one. These are all ingredients that are very, very well adapted to the complex setting. As soon as we leave the complex setting, in the sense that the operator is not uh, complex anymore, in the sense that it preserves subharmonic or these things, uh, it has no hope. Okay, but this is an ingredient. And I did this before because at some point it's, it's useful to have already one, at some point, every time one ingredient already known, instead of introducing all the new ingredients at some point. But now, let's try to present an idea, the strategy, of how we want to prove. It's a bit silly now, maybe, but we admit the existence of the maximal entropy and we try to reprove the existence of the measure of maximal entropy with another method. Okay, because we try the case phi equals zero now. So this was the theorem, uh, uh, I don't remember if it was two, the existence of the equilibrium states, let's say, we just try for phi equals zero. Which means, uh, let's try to reprove the existence of the measure of maximal entropy. Again, we don't try to reprove, we already know it exists, but we want to prove in a way for which we can quantify and get another norm, which is not the DSH, but which will contain the old the boundaries for the older amounts. This is the, this is the way, okay, so we want to redo, redo the construction in a way that it will work for all G older, some old, some and like that. So in this case, if I have L0, this is just the star, okay? So it's what we did until now. And I already know that lambda that I wrote before is D. One of the delicate parts, if we take phi different from zero, will be to know what is phi, what is lambda, the scaling factor. Here we don't have this problem, okay? Lambda is given, there is D. So let's try to do the construction. We do by, uh, so we try to start this, this sequence. Let's start D, but over the N. We want to find the constant CG. And it is good. Okay. If we do this, it means equidistribution for the brain images uh, by duality. So the idea is the following. Let me define uh, on P1, uh, for example, for simplicity, but the oscillation every time I write omega of a function as uh, max of G. Minus mean or G. Now we only use the continuous functions, okay? And actually, let me use G situ. Uh, let me use this root, okay? Let me just explain the bit. This one here. The very vague idea is that if I can, uh, I already take G, for example, means that G is a function. This is a function, yes, they apply this one and it will come. This is the test, I'm going by the body. And actually, I take a function for which the integral against new. Is zero. Okay. I take this one. So I know that the constant will be zero. Okay. I can I can just take away the constant and I know that I have to go to zero. So if I define this the, the oscillation, if I can prove that the oscillation of f and star g dn goes to zero, it means that the sequence here is zero. Okay, until here we agree. And like maximum minus minimum, okay? If I can prove that this function has maximum minus minimum go to zero, mm -hmm. and since the, maybe I should say better, that f star of g against mu is uh, g against uh, f star of mu, which is again mu up to a constant, so it's zero. <laughs> so the integral is always zero, it's fixed there. If the oscillation goes to zero, the function will go to zero. Okay, now only this will not be too interesting. If we can do this in some sense, quantitatively. Okay, because now we have to go to zero. We already know that what we want to do is something that will not go to zero to another function. And we don't also estimate the norm and blah, blah. So the point is get this one in a bit of quantitative way. Let's go to zero quantitative. Okay, 
Now, lemma, I say I sketched the bit before, but uh, let's see this. Uh, if I have if I have the unit disk, for example, if I have G on H on, from the unit disk to R, and suppose that I that, uh, that I have DDC of G less the DDC of H and the product is positive for simplicity. As I said before, uh, then this implies uh, that, uh, uh, let me define it this way. I define this one, uh, I said the oscillation, and let me define M G R is the max <coughs> of all A in P1. If I want to A in, uh, can be P1 or can be the space that I'm considering, okay? Of the oscillation of G on the say the ball of center R and the star. So it's the maximal oscillation that I can have of the value of the function at two point and distance at most r. Okay, it's what I need to estimate now. So this is the total oscillation. This is the oscillation on, on all balls of a, of a given change the center, but always the same radius. Mm -hmm. So this is if this goes to zero, r power gamma in uh, in r it means it's older, for example. Okay, this is just what I want to see. Now, the point here is that if the H is bounded, as I said before, so H bounded, I said before that it implies that G is bounded. Okay. Continuous implies continuous, which is game of upper subharmonicity, upper some continuity. If H is gamma older and G is gamma prime older. For some gamma prime, the same. Okay. Or we already see that it's not too good because we will lose something in some estimate if you get a gamma prime. But let me introduce another norm, which is weaker. Introduce, I mean, it's not that I it will invent it, but it was there. And uh, let me define it say that the norm G log P, given P an integer, at least one, let's say. Is the super on uh, AB on P1 of GA minus G of B times uh, one plus log uh, I minus B power. What do I mean? But for example, this is also equal to the super on the error. And A into one, the oscillation on the ball AR of G times the same. What I'm saying is that all the log, log of R, now it's R, is the R, R, R. I'm saying that if function is all there continued, it means that, the, as we say, the the n of g of uh, some things of radius r is uh, less than g older over r gamma. This is, this is the older function, okay? Log p continuous is a version as exponentially weaker than, than older that says the oscillation on the ball of radius r is, is less than your norm, okay? And then here I should put, I have to put one over, it's correct, yeah. Log r one plus log r like this. Yes, this goes to zero. This one, this one, as r goes to zero, this one goes to infinity. Okay, so this one goes to zero. It doesn't have to go to zero as a power of r as the goes to zero, but this is one the inverse of the logarithm. So it's something is infinitesimally weaker. Okay, we will see that it's not just the point of because we like this function because here if h is uh, log p continuous g is log p continuous the constant the norm log p could depend on something depending on p we don't care but the point is that we don't lose the norm it's a good norm for that for this machine of uh, uh, estimation of Laplace, we don't use regularity. And P is what? This is some number from one to infinity. 
take you one, uh, it's better to get at least one. We'll use that least two actually later, but it's, it's well defined. Okay, just for some power of this, we say, okay, it goes to zero very weakly with respect to older, and this is sufficiently weaker to say to get this one. This is less trivial to prove. I will not prove it uh, now, but in case I can, uh, I can explain if someone is interested. The constant here depends on P, but the point is, is one, we fix one P, and we are happy with this. Any P, it is true, okay? So if we get some estimate like this in the norm log P, log P, I'm not saying contracts or whatever, I'm saying it's an ingredient that for which we can use the DC now. So now the idea is, can we combine the norm DSH, which known as a gap, and the norm log P, which we know at least for which we can apply the estimate on the DC. Okay? Now, let's try. So, now, yes. What you're saying that after combining these things with your weaker than older, then miraculously you're going to get back to hope. Oh, that? No. You said you want the gap and hope, right? Ah, yes, yes, yes. Uh, no. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. I'm saying that if I combine this and this, I get a norm with some estimate. With this, I will define another, another, another. The norm number five, yes, older will, uh, will be okay with the number five and we'll have a gap. I mean, also, I'm not saying that this norm combining these two will have a gap. It's an ingredient for, for, it's a norm for which we have good estimates. Then we will get a norm which has a gap. Then we will do by some interpolation, a space which contains the older ones. We, every time we will make sure that every time C2 functions are inside with some good control on the norm. So at the end, all their functions are well approximated by, by C2 functions. And this will mean that, okay, in our space, there will be the older. Okay, this is the, the point, but then we need five norms. I, will, I hope to just give two or three. Just, just skip some steps. But let me try it here, also because we need a couple of less with five while zero. No problem is not there. So. Let's let's try to do this. Uh, let's, just one second. This theorem is quantitative, okay? In the sense that if I have a sequence GM like this, uh, all GN have the same estimate, okay? If I estimate all together with the same H, here the constant is independent on N, and all together I can estimate this. Okay, so we want to use this to the sequence, okay? To get the estimate of the sequence all together, at least to say the result is uh, is bound, it is as uh, something with some conditions. So let's try at least to write the, the first terms. So let's take for simplicity G, which is C2. Okay, again, let's just take this uh, in both case. So I take a C2 function. Okay, what I do? I try to do this. I try to take the DDC of F and star. G over the N. Okay. I'm just doing this. So this is the pattern that I want to go to, say, go to zero. This is the DC, and let's try to check the DC. Now, until now, there is no pi, so it's simple. I don't have a lot of the answer. This is F and star over the N of F of DDC of G. Okay, this will already be problematic later, but let's see. Now. This one up to a constant is less than omega. I should put the modulus here. Modulus, I mean, positive plus negative part. Up to this is less than omega. Okay, this part here, the modulus of this. So this one for every n is less than f n star omega over the power. Okay. No, nothing more than this. What does it mean? In particular, now we know that this one. Uh, how do I estimate now this one? I want to estimate uniform in n. Omega, the first idea is to say, okay, I can maybe write instead of writing as before with omega, let me write omega in this way. This plus PDC of uh, green minus green. Okay, this one we know it's called for some order. And we know that if I put forward this, this stays the same. 
Let me call the green uh, H, maybe. This one is uh, mu plus VDC F and star of H. Okay, H is minus the green, let's say. Okay, now what's the problem? If I try to estimate this, it's older, but as we know, if, even if I have a smooth function, if I iterate S star and I have a critical point, I lose the older. I mean, I, I mean, smooth becomes older, like uh, one over two older if I have a critical point of uh, multiplicity, for example. If I iterate again, I lose the gain. Here I'm trying to do something that has no condition on the critical point, so they can be very recurrent. So in norm older, there is no really way to estimate this part, okay? Can we have a way to estimate in uh, log p norm? Maybe, but until here, it's not very, it's not very clear which we are, how to do it. Okay, but on the other hand, we know that if we sum all of them, they will converge. So this term is also less than the sum of one over the n, f n star of the I put infinity. I don't care much because in any case, this converges. This is much one divided by the geometric term. This is well defined. This one I write as mu plus GDC of the sum of F and star of H over the N. Okay. Now, if I can prove that this one is a log P continued for some P, for all P, for example, then it means that every term here is bounded in the same log P norm for all N uniformly, which means I have the convergence at all the estimate they want. The sequence not only goes to zero, but is uh, if we continue the uh, uniformly bounded and whatever. Okay. And this then also have the light continues, even if we already know that the limit is zero. But this is the idea. Okay. How now we can estimate this thing is here? So, question Can we estimate this in some, in some normal? And then apply this one. Again, we have no real hope to use older because if I take the term n, I can hold, I, now it will be like uh, uh, gamma over uh, degree power n older. The, in general, for all there, there is no way. But we need the alternative. Maybe, but I don't put every, I don't put, yes, good point. I, I don't put any condition. And also, I, I'm not saying in higher dimension, but I want it works in higher dimension. Mm -hmm. So, but then we put one with Bender and two nice to be bounded there, but not the original one. Yeah, yes, 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 this is possible. If, if you start with something, uh, Wait, here I took situ, but I have something in mind that I want to get uh, something that a posteriori bound in the same norm that I that I started with. Okay. This is the this is the the point. But yes, if we if we were trying for a lower order, it, it would be do possible at least in dimension one. Now let's try to get this series, okay? Now the point here is that if So I have to say this series here, okay? Series of F and star H over the N. Okay? Or more generally, I'm taking a function G such that this is less than a series P and F and star of omega for some B less than the one. I take a function like this, a more general version of this, for example. This is the better in the Then my claim is that for every P, norm G log P is less than a constant and dependent. So this is bounded in all norm log P. Not in order, but it's not in norm log. If this is true, we have the convergence here. Okay, because we apply this to it here. Now, I have a how much time I have? Less. Minus epsilon. epsilon. Okay. Let me say the next two things to do here. You tell me if you want me to do them uh, or not. Uh, maybe the beginning tomorrow. One is to prove this one, and it's a series, and there are similar estimates to what I said. I, I'm not doing it now for the pullback because now we do estimate more delicate because there is a holder and log p and pull the pull forward. So in some sense, these are the same idea that I didn't do before. And the second is how to get a norm. <laughs> Because how do we quantify this? We cannot use the older because it will lose it. We cannot use even log p. 
But now let me try to do this. I, I try, I just go, this one, if you want, I do tomorrow the computation, eh? if you want, you tell me. But let me define a norm, G, P, which is uh, defined in this way, that DDC, the, the minimum, let's say, integer of the constant C, such that DDC of G is less, is less or equal than the sum, let's say it's, it's uh, it depends on uh, alpha, and I want to fix, uh, let's say just alpha for now, let's write it work. Mm -hmm. This one, less than alpha n, f n star of omega, for some alpha less than one. Okay, this converges, because it's geometric, okay? It's a probability. I define this number. Now, what's the, suppose that I can prove, this lemma tells me this norm defines a space of log p function for all p. So they are all continuous, okay? It's, uh, it's, it's this lemma. Can I get a gap here? But now, instead of trying to, this norm depends on f, is what I say. Instead of trying to say f is very regular, not regular, I put f in the definition of the norm. If f is very, if f is very recurrent at the critical point, this norm becomes very weak because this loses a lot of regularity. If F is hyperbolic, this is essentially the, the C2 norm. <laughs> Nothing more than this. Where is C in the definition? <laughs> yes, linearity, Thomas, thanks. So, okay, you have this one, okay? So if F is very singular, this becomes very weak and takes into account the dynamic inside. Now, let me try to say, okay, is there hope to have a gap? Let me try F star of G. Norm alpha. Well, I mean, if G is bounded in this way, F star of G is bounded by C, uh, one over alpha, sum, I take alpha n plus one, Fn, uh, Fn plus one omega. I just apply F to the series, it shifts everything. Up to taking the next alpha, I lose a factor alpha here. Okay? And uh, it means that F star G norm alpha is less than one over alpha. Okay. Now, this is F star. I have to divide by D, my method. So F star over D is, I, I gain a factor D here. This I can do for every alpha less than one. I will take an alpha very close to one. Okay, the at least more than the, the, the one over D, in order that this one will be the number. Okay, now for phi equal zero, this is the idea. Okay, now you could tell me, uh, okay, you have a gap, but essentially it's again something about, uh, I don't know, C2 or whatever. But the point is that my norm alpha is bounded by the norm C2. So every C2 function defines, uh, satisfies this. Now, if I, if I define by interpolation in the same way that, what is the older function? The older function is a function that can decompose in two parts. So G is older, essentially. If I can, let's say for every epsilon, I, I can decompose G as G1 epsilon plus G2 epsilon with the property that G1 epsilon in norm infinity is less than epsilon. And how much the norm C2 of this one is diverging? This is diverging polynomially in one over epsilon. That depends on, on gamma here. There is a dependence on gamma. But the idea is that all their functions are those that I can decompose and up to way up to cost epsilon, close to epsilon, epsilon close, there is a C2 function, but the C2 norm diverges polynomially in epsilon, in one over epsilon, okay? I already tell you the trailer that the log p function are those that I can do the same, but sub-exponentially one over epsilon. And sub-exponentially, I will not be rewarded in this kind of method. So if now I define my norm in the same way, the function that are decomposable, one part small in norm infinity, and the other one with this norm diverging the polynomial. In this norm, I have a gap. Interpolation will say that the gap will stay. And now this one will be contained. Yes. Yes. This is, uh, I mean, there are, there are some pages to do for this, uh, especially if there will be the weight. But yes, once I have a gap on this norm, 
if I create a, a, analogous of the older norm, in the same way that I said the other time, once I prove the theorem for C2 and I have a bound in C0, I have the bound in all C, C gamma. Here, if I get the gap for my norm alpha and I have some bound in zero, I get the spectral gap in the meter. And this will be the idea. And this will contain all the factors. And this bounded order. So this is the idea of the method just for phi equals zero. Okay. Now, if you want to take f star, f n star of e phi, blah, 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 g, you have all the other term that comes. And this is the point of what one has to estimate. Okay. So this is what I will try to do tomorrow. But this at least the method just for phi equals zero to explain the main idea. Okay. The, and the main idea is really this one. To find some norm that more or less work well, because now I use omega. Later with phi, I cannot use omega. You have to replace this by something else yeah. because it's more similar. This by here I use C2, otherwise I cannot put omega. There will be, there will be another intermediate stuff. But the real point is this the analytical series. I don't try to estimate the regularity. I make F doing it for me. If F is singular, I say, okay, then I'm very weak. Estimate. This is the estimate, okay? And then, okay, then the interpolation is technical, it's not really a uh, main cost. Okay, so may I stop here? And, uh... Any further questions? What's my name? Now, speaking of ingredients, maybe it's time to look at lunch. <laughs>